Thanks for listening to The Adam Carolla Show on Podcast One. Well, Perez Hilton calls in and tells us all about how he uh, got the uh, eggs and how much they cost to get his three kids and the whole process of the surrogate and the astounding price of it and shopping for eggs. And it's a very interesting conversation. So we'll do that. We'll take some calls as well. First, I'll tell you about Pure Talk USA with AT&T, are you? Maybe you're with Verizon. Maybe you're with T-Mobile. Pure Talk USA uses the exact same network as they do. All the same towers, same coverage, but at literally half the cost. I'm a customer. I kept my phone. First thing I said is I don't want to get my phone. They sent me a SIM card. Get the same service as before for half. Unlimited talk and text. Two gigs of data. Also uh, just 20 bucks a month. Average person saves 400 bucks a year. Why? People are like, well, why is it so much cheaper? How do they do it? Well, no retail stores, no billion-dollar ad campaigns. I mean, think about it. You only pay for the data you need. U.S.-based customer service, and the CEO is a veteran. So grab your phone, dial pound 250, say keyword Adam Carolla to save 250 bucks off any iPhone, including the new iPhone SE. That's pound 250 and say Adam Carolla. Just $25, you get wine and gifts. Ace's favorite stuff or products from ACS. Every single month, you get the drink you choose. It's hard to be cool stuff and lose. Adam's Monthly Nut. Adam's Monthly Nut. You heard Dick. It's time for another ballsy month of Adam's Monthly Nut. This month includes two Vinnie Tortorich approved and invented ultra fat instant energy packs so you don't reach for that donut. Four shot glass ice molds so you can keep your whiskey cold and straight down the hatch. A bottle of Chateau Spill to remove wine stains or blood from the fine silk you're donning. Of course, a bottle of your choice. And the coup de gras, a digital download of the very first basic cable commentary, Roadhouse. This $60 value can be yours for only 25 bucks at CorollaDrinks.com. From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, Perez Hilton. With Gina Grad on news, Paul Bryan on sound effects, and Jeff Cesario with the sports. And now, it was so smoky in L.A. today, he wore a mask on the horse trail voluntarily. Adam Carolla. Uh, get it on. Got to get on a church. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you. Right, Gina Grad? That's right. Handball, Brian. She tasted like champagne. <laughs> Is that Perez Hilton? That's an old Perez old Hilton, Perez Hilton. the radio show. We will uh, talk to Perez, old friend Perez, uh, in, a, in a couple of few. I had a, a few thoughts. You guys uh, tell me if this happens in your life. It's fairly reoccurring in my life, which is uh, Max Zapata. Have you been around me and Mike August when we talk to people about the naked picture of Tom Dreesen at the improv? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. I just interviewed Tom Dreesen. Tom Dreesen. It a, sounds like you just passed him like a, uh, a Russian code. <laughs> Someone on a park bench. You don't want to get like. Oh, yeah. Him. The eagle flies backwards at midnight. <laughs> yeah. So Tom Dreesen's a legendary stand up, came up with Letterman, opened for Frank Sinatra famously, toured the world with Frank Sinatra for 14 years, but opened for Sammy Davis Jr. And been there, done that. You know, done Letterman 40 times and done The Tonight Show 60 times and all that. And Mike August and I, and uh, the, I'll, I'll hurry up with the story, but so we can get to the part that's important. Mike August and I, Mike used to watch comedians at the improv, uh, the Melrose improv all the time. And I used to go there in the early 80s and wait in line to do the open mics in the early 80s on a Sunday night. And it always struck me that there was a picture of a comedian, a naked comedian, that was on a poster 
Back when it was a novelty, if somebody made a picture into a poster that wasn't Fair Fawcett, it was like a, a, a civilian into a poster. Anyway, uh, Mike and I, and I said to Mike one day, I said, Mike, where that picture? Was that Tom Dreesen who was wearing the Cubs ball cap and sort of had his ass turned? And he did a move where he stood sort of three quarter where you could kind of see one cheek and he turned and he was wearing a Cubs hat. And uh, he said, Mike August said, yeah, that was Tom Dreesen. They used to have that poster up uh, behind the bar for a million years. And I said, yeah. So I thought it was Tom Dreesen and Mike thought it was Tom Dreesen. But one night we were at the improv. We were talking to like someone behind the bar. And we said, remember that old poster back there? The naked uh, comedian. Was that Tom Dreesen? And the guy's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. We said, but back in the day, there was a poster of a naked guy. And he's like, I've been here for 20 years. I don't, I don't remember any poster. Like, but, uh, naked. And then we found like the manager and we talked to guys who worked there in the eighties and we would talk to guys who like booked the room and went there all the time. And we go, that old poster, there was an old poster of a naked comedian. Was that Tom Dreesen? And they'd go, I don't remember any poster. That, and I was like, I, I was going deep, nuts. It yes. deepens because uh, I don't know if this is the bartender, but wasn't there a famous bartender at the improv who was there for some 30 years or something? Well, we should have dug him up. I don't know if we spoke to him, but everyone we talked to who had freak had either had some experience working the club or booking the club or working at the club way back when told me and Mike we were nuts and they had no idea what we were talking about. And this I was like, very you, Twin Peaks. this is insane I, because Mike's all over the road in the memory department. And maybe I am, too. But we both remember a poster of a naked Tom Dreesen. And it wasn't there for 18 months. It was there for 15 years, right behind there every time. And everyone just looked at it and said, we have no idea what you're talking about. And so finally, I cornered Tom Dreesen out front of the Laugh Factory some months ago. And I went. First off, was there a poster of you naked? And he was like, oh, yeah, it was It was behind the bar at the Improv for many years. And I was like, of course it was. Why won't anyone go along with this story? And I said, well, what was this? I thought it was his album cover. I thought it was comedy art. I thought it was some sort of promotional thing. Right. I said, what was the story with that? This is a mystery for Mike Carano. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I took all the pictures for the improv for decades. Yes. We should uh, should ask now. So this is not that. So what happened is uh, Tom Dreesen is doing Letterman show. Letterman Dreesen is one of the first comedians Letterman meets when he moves out here to California and parks his pickup truck out front of the comedy store. And Dreesen is already <laughs> established. And so him and Letterman become old friends and he's a guest on Letterman, I guess in the, probably in the mid eighties. And, uh, he, he pulls out a Cubs hat and he says to Letterman, I brought you a gift knowing Letterman's, I don't know if he's a Yankees fan or maybe he's in whatever teams in Indiana fan. Um, and he hands him the Cubs hat and Letterman probably just cause the cameras are rolling, takes it and like throws it, you know, in a, in the, in the, in a way to, to dismiss it. And uh, they get into a fake argument about it, and Tom like throws a chair, and it's 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 a thing. And then later on, Tom's brother is a pro professional photographer, and Tom puts on the, the the Cubs hat, takes this like nude picture of himself, says like you can take anything, but you can't take my Cubs hat, kind of thing. Sends it to Letterman as a private joke to Letterman. Letterman then blows it up, puts it in the back of women's magazines and men mag men's <laughs> magazines and puts like escort numbers and services and stuff and essentially scatters it all over the place and essentially humiliates Tom Dreesen, who took this naked picture and thought it was kind of between the two of two of them, like Captain America did with his dick pic the other day. That's right. right. That's right. Yep. So, of course, the thing gets blown up. It gets spread around and it ends up behind the bar. At the improv in Melrose, where where it was there for many a year, except for nobody who ever worked there has any thoughts about it, except for me and Mike August. But we're not nuts because that's where it was, and that was Dreesen's ass, and it was never, it was never an album cover, and it was. But you know, the thing that was funny about it back in the day, it looked like it was professionally shot. 
which now you can do anything on an iPhone. Right. But back then, like you had, there was such Big a thing deal. as photography, you know, and this uh-huh. looked like a photographer. So I always thought it was his album cover or something. But yes, Gina. Conspiracy theory. Mm. Somebody in the Dreesen camp, perhaps Dreesen himself, finally had enough, wants it down, and the employees were told never to speak of it again. I don't know how it works. I don't worked. know what you're talking about. Uh, anyway, what do you want to drink? I, it, was, here, it was a good fella situation. Everyone who knew about the fun was killed. Right? <laughs> here's, here's, here's what I have learned in life from speaking to many people about many things. Um, people need a setting, and that setting is, I don't know. I don't recall, but it's not <laughs> certainly not saying it wasn't there. They just go, nope. I worked there for 10 years, never saw it, doesn't (laughs) exist. And that's what everyone, everyone does that for everything now. And so that leaves Mike and I with our vague recollections about this poster, talking to someone who worked there saying we're nuts. We know what we're talking about. So that was the Tom Dreesen. That down 30 years ago. (laughs) Tell the large Mars sent you. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, that was, uh, that, that was uh, that story. Finally, finally figured out uh, that story. Uh, it's my dad's birthday today. I right. think he's 89 years young. Oh, uh, I had a, uh, I was sitting across from him the last time I was, all my dad really has is his trumpet and his books. Those are his, those are his two things, his trumpet and his books. And he, uh, he's, he's, uh, he lives in a very modest house, probably a thousand, maybe 1100 square feet, very small in the valley and he sits he just sits in his sort of den living room and he has his books and he has his trumpet and trumpets and i sit across from him and behind him is his his bookshelf filled with books and i was just sort of talking to him and i was looking up and i saw dennis prager's rational bible up on there and i said Oh, all right. Well, that's nice. He's reading Dennis Prager's Rational Bible. And then we started talking like, well, what's up with you? And I said, well, I just dropped my uh, sixth book. And uh, so that's out as we speak. And then I looked back up at the bookshelf and I thought, I don't see any of my books on that bookshelf, which, by the way, just faces me. When I sit, I sit across from him. I I got up and took a couple of pictures. It's it's not a oh, large they're shrink. They're shrinkets bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> you can see my dad's head down at the bottom of the picture, and then uh, right behind him is uh, said bookshelf. And I thought to myself, I got a lot of books. And the thing about now, here's how you know. Here's where the commitment comes in. My dad loves reading, and he loves. He likes comedy and he likes reading. So it's bizarre. Those are I, I made a Reese's peanut butter cup for him. I understand yeah. he's not into vintage racing and he's not a logger, but he does like reading and comedy. And that's where the interesting non-commitment to family kicks in, which is you think you're going to build some bridge from, well, he likes reading and he likes comedy and you like football and you like boxing. So how are you going to build this bridge? You realize once you write the books and your books are comedy and they don't buy those books or they don't read those books or they don't avail themselves, you realize there is no bridge. What else can be done? There is nothing. I guess I could write uh, Adam Carolla's History of the Flugelhorn, part one. (laughs) You know what? Make that up in Photoshop. I'm just going to put it around. uh, Put it around Moby Dick. Just yeah, make the jacket, put around Moby Dick, and I'll just wave it around. We'll see if my dad good. wants to see it. I actually, title it Dennis Prager's History of the oh, Flugelhorn by Adam Carolla. <laughs> All right, forward by Adam Carolla and uh, Chuck Mangione. All right, so that was interesting. I was just looking at this wall of books going, why? Uh... Now, to be fair, I could have. I didn't go into his bedroom. All six of them could oh, be yeah. piled high on his nightstand. Nice nice display, yeah, exactly. No, no, reti- like a retired by- jersey. He has to keep him by the bed. He reads a chapter a night before bed. How atypical is this behavior? Does this seem in a non... Uh, d- d- it's not atypical for your family. R- right. I say for you. But in general, like wouldn't one, one who appreciates books, buys books, and r- sits and reads books all day long? Why? Okay. Yeah, just to put this in a little bit of 
perspective, um, Steve Grad, my father, um, has framed pictures of my dance recitals from my gawkiest of years all over the house because he has such nachas, such pride in his mm. daughter and his family. Yeah. And I haven't written a book. All I have are old dance photos, and those are framed. Are these pictures before the nachas started growing? So. <laughs> This was pre nachis pre nachis Okay. Yeah, so, we got it, everyone. So but t- I, tasteful. <laughs> but he also has my New York headshots up, and those are nachis heavy. I wow. get it, man. You got to work, man. Sometimes you got to show a little <laughs> cleavage to get that gig. Yeah. Anyway, I started thinking, like, maybe I should just come up with, like, a vacuum foam made book of all six of my books just piled together like like what you do if you made a safe there was really no book and you could just put it up in your bookshelf and stack other books next to it although I'm trying to think who would buy this other than my dad who wouldn't buy it but uh yeah i was just looking up at this wall of books going i write a lot of books i wonder how come none of these books are on it and Again, it's not like he's, you know, some, you know, oh, his his English is okay. He speaks broken <laughs> Italian. He's from the old world. You know, it's like he loves reading comedy, which is the bizarre part of this. All right. But on a, on a newer note, we'll get back to Gina in a second with her dad because I do want to talk about that subject. Um, I am slated to leave right after this show for... Where am I going? Tennessee. Yeah, I'm going to Nashville. I'm going to Tennessee. I'm doing a thing for Nissan, which is, I don't know, 40 minutes out of Nashville uh, in Tennessee. Nissan used to be out here, but, of course, uh, we put an end to that. So they moved to Tennessee. And uh, I'm leaving directly after the show. It is me, Chris Maxipata, and Matt DeAndrea. We have uh, three first-class tickets purchased by Nissan. And uh, we shall be wheels up as soon as the show ends to go out and do a bit. I will be broadcasting, as it were, from uh, Tennessee tomorrow. No interruption in the show. Um, I walked out of the studio after talking to Tom Dreesen 20 minutes ago. And Matt said, um, and this is uh, Matt Fondelier, he said, there's a first class ticket for Chris. And there's a first class ticket for Matt DeAndrea. Yours has been canceled. <laughs> I said, well, what? who canceled it? Of, and he of said, course. Delta says yours is canceled and there are no more first class seats. <laughs> I said, well, Nissan just booked three first class tickets. So why would we do? Why would Nissan cancel the tickets for the guy they're flying out to do the corporate gig for? Well, that's what Delta says. So uh, that was the last I heard. And then now the idea is bu- get a ticket on the plane somewhere okay. on the plane. Of course. Well, Matt or Chris are going to have to flip for that seat. First yeah. class is full. Matt, did any uh, updates? Yeah, we got a Comfort Plus seat. So you'll be swapping with Chris Loxamana. <laughs> Oh. Went to Chris, every season first class seat. That's and also, true. I just yeah. I just want to say for the record, I did not book this flight. If this was booked by me, everything would have been perfectly smooth. That is that <laughs> this is, is why that. I should be getting paid like a travel agent on top of my normal salary. All right, <laughs> go look up okay. what the average travel agent makes a year these days <laughs> in twenty twenty. We'll just go ahead and then in add, the middle of a pandemic, add eight percent onto that, and that'll be your base. <laughs> You'll also be glad to know your TSA number is working. Yeah. All right, so. I, I was especially interested in Brian. Brian is my, uh, he is my divining rod. There's two guys I go to with like travel. Actually, Daniel Kellison, Danny Two Sheets Kellison is the guy who goes, oh, here's what you got to do to get in the lounge. I say, I am the opposite of that person. I don't know. Nothing works. The mileage, the things, the, the, all the tricks, all the, all the, um, the, what do we call it? The wiring, the, uh, short, what do we call it? What's Short that? Circuit? Life hacks. All the travel oh, hacks yeah. and stuff that yep. Brian, Brian's on top of, of all that. So now we have three tickets. Of course, my first class ticket was thrown away. Uh, now I have the coach <laughs> ticket. Now we're all going on to the airplane. And maybe for once, it's a good time we're all going to be turning right. Because mm. if you have to turn left, maybe there's a little more of a demarcation sort of line there. But we're all turning right. When do I swap tickets with Max Apata? How does this work? What is the play? How does Brian make sure that he's sitting up in first class with a different name on his ticket? 
Once you get into the boarding line, you can have any boarding pass you want. They don't check your ID against your boarding pass. So just grab his and you take the, and vice versa and you're good to go. You have and to obviously have, you have to obviously have through security. They're going to double check, you know, right. your name and everything. But once you get into that line, in fact, uh, if you, if Matt or anyone were to uh, print out your original first class ticket, the one that was canceled, but they would never know that, just bring that to the first class lounge and say, hey, here's my first class ticket. They're mm-hmm. not going to fucking look it up in the system like all right first class ticket here you go i'm under the impression that that's not possible i don't think they can print out that ticket i think somehow it got canceled but i i don't know that matt matt didn't book it so i gotta i'll ask him if matt can do it for sure go ahead well brian that's very that's that's a good book smart answer perfectly acceptable here's the thing that you're overlooking you're working way smarter uh, you should be working way smarter. You have mm. your mask on. They challenge you. You'd say, I'd love to show you who I am. I cannot and will not take this mm. mask off. I am Chris Laxamana. How about the fact that Chris Laxamana has a crazy foreign name and I'm a A-list celebrity? Do you think that may cause some friction? I mean, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Keep the mask on. Once you get past security, just swap boarding passes. No one's gonna. No one checks against ID. Yeah. So you get onto the plane with it, and they don't. They don't ask for ID when you're getting when they're looking at it again to get on the plane. No. Yeah. I still feel like get through that aspect of it and swap it in the uh, in the uh, jet, jet line, way. the jetway. It's just one less person to possibly go. I remember you don't. That's not you. That's a good point. You could be recognized. Keep the mask on. Do it. Yeah, he can sit down in the first class seat. Keep it warm for you, and then do a little switcheroo. I don't even want him to sit in it no, because yeah, I feel I like was, I feel it's going to look like a swap yes, at that point. Agreed. I think we, I think you slum it with me, and we'll both enter late. Okay. Yeah. All right. Poor Chris <laughs> got screwed out of a first class ticket. <laughs> All right, Gina, let's talk about you. There have been questions. People are like we know why Brian's yeah. not coming in. Why is Gina not coming in? And you're going to address that. Yeah, it's it's been inc- it's been a very tough uh, eleven months, and um, you know we all have stuff we're going through, and of course you know Brian's going through so much, but this has been um, hands down, no question, the hardest year of my life. Um, long story short, just because at this point it is what it is, I outcome wise, I don't think we're we're waiting for it to get any better. So I'm, I'm a little more comfortable uh, addressing it, but um, I'll, I'll keep it short. My dad, who a lot of people may, may or may not be aware of, big uh, broadcaster at ESPN in the 80s and, and sportscaster out here uh, for, in LA for decades and decades, perfectly fine, high energy, peel him off the roof, goes to sleep after everybody else, runs 20 miles a day. It's, he's a wind-up toy, was just tired last year and he just kept being like oh like I just I can't jog like I used to and it got to the point where he's like when I'm done driving I just sit in the car for a second before I open the door and I'm like what the fuck are you what is going on couldn't figure it out so he went to a bunch of doctors they said you're fine we don't know what you're talking about he finally did get diagnosed with a rare form of cancer they said it's really not a big deal actually we'll put a chemo port in In two weeks, it'll be like this never happened by Thanksgiving, last Thanksgiving. They said it'll literally be like this never happened. So we didn't worry about it. Long story short, we, he had the chemo port in, uh, as Brian may, may be able to better describe when you are on chemo, you have no immune system. Is that correct? I mean, yeah, more or less. Yes. Yes. Depressed, very depressed. Suppressed. Yeah, correct. Suppressed. Thank you. Um, in that two week period of having a suppressed immune system, he got a very, rare disease. Um, Very rare, very fatal. Nobody knew it. Didn't get diagnosed for weeks. He was, he's went into the hospital and um, comatose. Um, I was calling rabbis. I was being told, Gina, don't worry. I can plan a funeral in five minutes. This is what we do for rabbis. Don't worry. So this has been every day since the beginning of last October. Let it turn um, to something else. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Just let it turn. Just to turn. Else, okay. So, thank you. Try to buy um, time. <laughs> the good news is he finally did come out of a coma after many, many months and many like 
rushing to the hospital right from the show because a nurse who took pity on me called and said, Gina, he opened his eyes earlier. Mm. Um, come in and maybe I can get him to do it again. And racing out to the hospital and hearing something you do not want to hear, which is, Steve, open your eyes for your daughter, Steve, Steve, Steve. And after five minutes saying, we're sorry, we thought we could get him to open his eyes. Me going, no problem. Crying all the way to my car, going home. This, is, this has been since last October. He finally, they finally figured out what it was. Very, very rare illness. And he had a couple of strokes in a coma. So he's now awake. He knows who I am. That was also a hilarious point in time um, at the end of last year where he just knew me as the lady that came in every day, but he didn't know why. That's how I know you. (laughs) (laughs) So I put family pictures. How old is Steve? He just turned 70. Just turned 70. So he was 69 when this happened. Wow. And, you um, don't know, Gina, yeah. but how do they yeah. know when you have a stroke in a coma? They don't. Oh. This was after. This was in recovery, oh. you know, looking at blood work and stuff like that. So first of all, off the record, I diagnosed his first stroke. And everyone thought I was fucking crazy. Mm. And I, because I came in and he was, you know, he was his, himself. And then I came in and he was staring at the wall like this. And I ran to get something. Everybody told me I was nuts. It's, he's tired. It's medication. I said, I'm not a doctor, but that's what a stroke is. Everybody told me I was wrong. Let me tell you something. I've said it once. I'll say it again. I would trust a concerned Jewess with a smartphone (laughs) over a floor of doctors. You care. You have that phone on you. I know what I, I know what he is like when he's not like this. It's an interesting thing. They, you know, Yuli's oil and all this kind of stuff. It's like there's all these stories of like, the, but the mom who wanted to find the yep. cure. And it's like, that's what caring does. It's not that doctors don't care. It's that they care and then they get paid and then they go home. And it's, yeah. they care for 12 people at a time. Right. Whatever it is. right. And I've, I've learned a lot. And Brian, I'm sure you have a lot to say on this matter. But boy, I knew nothing about this in advance. I know so much about the healthcare system and the hospital system. The appeals court through Medicare knows me by name. Mm. This is not my world. It became my world quickly. They want to turn and burn those beds. A hospital is not where you go to recover. It's where you go to stabilize. I did not know this. So um, lots and lots and lots has has happened. And I've, I've learned and, and grown up very, very quickly. Um, getting to the the point of why I'm not coming in is I'm the only one who still has um, contact with my dad because now he's in a, a skilled facility, which of course has been locked down since March. I have seen my dad a handful of times since then when I always tell him I break him out of jail for doctor's appointments. Of course, you know, as, and this is the fu- this is the joke in the grad family. He used to torture me with this and it used to make me so mad, especially as a teenager, because I have a brother and it used to make me so mad. He'd go, remember, Gina, a son is a son till he takes a wife, a daughter is a daughter the rest of her life. And I would bet I would get so pissed. And now I say that to him and he laughs. Well, he he smiles. He doesn't he speak. acknowledges. Yeah, he, he acknowledges speak. he can't move. Wow. He's completely dependent. Um, but I know who I'm talking to and I know exactly who I'm talking to because he's still very sarcastic. Last time we were getting off the phone, um, I said, I love you, but he didn't say anything. And he usually mouths, I love you. And I said, do you love me? And I got this, this is visual. Then I'll explain it. I got, you were zooming. (laughs) Yeah. I got a shrug. I got a, I could (laughs) take you or leave you. I laughed so hard. He's in there. He's in there. So I have to be very careful because I'm I am taking care of somebody who a stiff wind would put in the ground. And I'm just doing everything I can because I'm I'm I follow the ambulances to the appointments. I write all the notes. I hold his hand, which is very um what's the word where you can't open your hand? Oh, well, it's like clenched. Yeah. And you know, I'm just I'm the daughter. I'm the daughter that's there for the rest of her life. So I just have to be really careful by proxy because I'm the only one who's with him. So well, I appreciate you letting me um, address that. And, I, and I'm a sorry that I haven't felt comfortable addressing it till now, but it's been a hell of a year. Well, he's lucky to have you. Thank and, you. And, uh, you know, it's why you have to, uh, it's why I have to build up that goodwill. You know, you have, <laughs> exactly. to be, you have to be a good dad, you know? You know, I'll tell you one thing. And this is talk about uh, shit that he probably wouldn't want me to say publicly. 
you know, he it, the grad house was a uh, had its, had its faults in the 80s growing up, you know, in the grass. Too much love? Mm-hmm. Yeah, too much love, a little uh, a little loud, a little screamy, a little full of un- undiagnosed ADD from just about everybody. Um, you know, a little traumatizing. And I first, when I moved out here and I was a, a total fucking mess, I'm sure you guys could never picture that. He was the one that just was on my ass all the time. I should go to therapy. I should go to therapy. So I finally agreed. And my dad, who, you know, imperfect, doesn't begin to describe it, even though he was the best. He was also very, uh, very shouty. Um, I was on my way into the therapist as an adult for the first time. (laughs) And he said these words, and I will never forget them. And I will always be grateful for them. I go, okay, dad, I'm here. And he's going, I'm going in. And he said, all right, have a great time. And remember, don't protect me. And that always stuck with me because, as you guys know, that's my nature. It took, yeah. Well, he didn't mean no. He that's didn't. that's a real statement. Sorry to that go all a... uh, Brian Gumble on you with the. <laughs> hmm. But uh, that was a big deal. I'll never forget that. He's kind of saying, uh, look, maybe I wasn't the greatest all the time. And uh, a young woman is definitely going to have to. My name's going to come up in front of that <laughs> therapist. And you don't have to build a statue or a monument. My name. You, you're allowed mm-hmm. to talk, sh- talk about me warts and all. So uh, yep. and he's he's the best. And he's he, nobody's grown more as a human being than my dad. Nobody expected this to happen. He's always also tortured me with the threat that he was going to live till 114. So this came as a shock to all of us. And I just I just want to be really careful while he's here. Hypothetically, if you are a three times New York Times bestselling author, uh, would he have one of your books in the hospital room? No, he wouldn't. Just He'd have a thousand a of my thousand. books. Oh man, I felt good for a second. <laughs> He'd build his house out of out of books as long as his, his daughter Shana Punham was facing inside. Uh, all right. Well, thank you for that uh, that candor, Gina Grad. I know it's a my difficult pleasure. thing to talk about, but I think I think it'll shed a lot of light to the people that are listening. Yeah. Thanks, um, guys. I hope that helps. I got a couple calls. Been on hold for a few minutes, so we'll try to mow through those before we talk to Perez. Uh, George, 30, Irvine. Let's see. Did I punch him? I punch him up. Hey, George. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Hi. Hold on a second. I, 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 I think it's an old school thing. I don't know if we need it today, but you know, it's funny if you listen to enough talk radio and stuff like people are on hold and then you go, hello? And they go, hold on a second. Let me put down this transmission case. And there's like all this like banging and chumbling around stuff. Don't you guys feel like in the modern era, you just have an earpiece in yeah. and like there's time no talk. difference between time to talk or let yeah. me get you off this thing. All right. Sorry, George. You're going to clean. You're going to clear up uh, the Pepino Cuevas story. Yes. I, I want to try to please. Pepino Cuevas oh, is sure. a legendary boxer. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you know him, and I just wanted to tell you that uh, he, his dad used to work at a international port, mm-hmm. and an Italian an Italian guy came over, and he will call the kids Pipino, the boys, and Pipina, the girls. Oh, that's so, that's so the story helpful. That he's done. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is so helpful to me because. Um, uh, again, my my nanny Olga speaks Spanish, and uh, many years ago, I said to her, uh, "Papino Cuevas, Papino, it's a nickname. What, what's Papino mean?" She goes, "It means cucumber." And I said, "Cucumber Cuevas, <laughs> like that seems like a horrible boxing name. Cucumber, cucumber, Papino." I was like, "Okay, I guess he went by cucumber." Uh, so I'm glad you cleared that up, George. That was an Italian guy who gave him the yes. Papino. But wasn't his first name was his first name Pepe or some version of that? No, Jose. Uh, the Jose. announcer, the announcer wasn't familiar with Pepino, and he named him Jose, kind of like <laughs> like his stage name. Uh huh. And it stuck. But he even in in the interviews he says, "My name is not Jose; it's only Pepino Cuevas." Oh, wow. But there's something on his birth certificate, right? Yes, Pepino Cuevas. <laughs> wow. Oh, wait okay. a minute. What are the... Hold on. The Italian businessman dubbed him Pepino, but there must be something else on his birth certificate, right? 
You guys understand there's a little yeah, disconnect here be, with this story? How could that be his name before he got his nickname? Jose Isidro Pepino. You know what I'm saying, George? Yeah, no. Uh, his dad heard the Italian say Pepino to boys. He didn't give him the name, and he named his boy Pepino after hearing that from an Italian Oh, guy. his dad heard him say it before he yeah, was yeah, born. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, now we got it. Thank you for that piece of uh, information. That that's what you call a panty dropper at a bar. You go to a bar with college age girls. Your and you, his name is Jose. You got the inside line on Pepino Cuevas and where he got his name. <laughs> panty dropper. You're buying. Man. I can't hear you. Buying us more Jose Cuervo. You guys know Danny Little Red Lopez. Uh, he, he, d- does he work the door? Danny Little. He was one of the greatest welter weights the sixties ever produced. Oh, God, he had welts? What What did you say? Jesus Christ. Pepina Cuevas, Danny Little Red Lopez, three epic battles back when they would go 15 rounds, and that's Ooh. with seven-ounce gloves. They go 15? Oh, I don't need him to wear a glove. <laughs> okay, do you, you have any idea... All right, let me let me just throw a few names off you just to see where, okay. where we stand. You don't know Danny Little Red Lopez? No, if he doesn't work the door, I don't know him. All right, but you know you you saw the movie Raging Bull, right? You Jake LaMotta, another oh, great. Ra- lo- yeah, I love it. The guy at the front always makes me ride the Raging Bull around midnight. No, when no, I'm no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, you know Rocky Marciano? Do you know that there was a Rocky Graziano? Uh, is he in Sig Up? I love those guys. I party with them all the time. <laughs> Speaking of apps, what did you say, SIG app? Uh, speaking Sig of that, app. do you have a cigarette machine in here? And I want to order some uh, s- stuffed uh, potato skins for an appetizer. Ooh, so Stuff my potato? They usually don't just come out and say it. <laughs> yeah, so you don't know, you know, Danny Little Red Lopez. You don't know. I think he works in the back. Rocky Hold on, I'll get him. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, the greatest of all time, Willie Pep. Come on now. Willie well, I don't. I don't know. You want me to ask him? Sh- no, no. Willie Pep. Willie Pep. Is the name of, of a, a guy, one of the greatest fighters of the forties. He uh, fought think- Sh- Sugar Ray Robinson many times. Many times. Sugar Ray. Oh, Sugar Ray Robinson. Oh yeah. Hold on. Let me get your adult drink menu. That's on there. Hold on. I'll get you a Sugar. Uh, no, Robinson. no. That's a they different. Put sugar around the glass. You're gonna love it. Oh sweetie. man. All right. Keep the panties on. I'm going to the old timers bar. And scene. Uh, all right. Let's see. Perez Hilton is uh, waiting. There's a Netflix documentary oh Keith wants God, to talk about. Amazing. I haven't seen amazing. it. Keith 41, Oregon. Keith? Adam. Yeah. What's going on? Uh, Net- new Netflix doc, yeah, Social no, Dilemma. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, curious about your thoughts about the uh, Social Dilemma. I don't know if Gina and, Bre- and Bald have seen it. Yeah. Um, I have not seen it, it yet. It, it scared the fucking shit out of me. <laughs> it should be required viewing. It's It didn't scare me so much as empower me because it gives you all the information. They uh, Keith, just to give a quick one sentence, it's Facebook, Google, Snapchat, Instagram, all the major players in the social media market, people that used to work there, tell you how the algorithms work, how they uh, target different people to and the divide it causes in the country, how it the dopamine spikes that it does on a personal level, how it um, figures out exactly what you want at that moment. And then it goes later into how it causes, you know, world chaos and world good. Yeah, well, man, I mean information or the manipulation of information or the manipulation of people's opinions are more powerful than any battleship or atomic bomb, if you really kind of think about it. And there's really only one remedy for this, which is distance. You just physically have to get some distance from these from these devices. But they address that because they because the the addictive qualities in there are not on purpose. Nothing on any of these sites are there on purpose or not are there coincidentally. Yeah. It's all on purpose. They want you to be addicted. One of the main uh, key guys in it worked for Google and he said, but no one ever asked, how do we make this less addictive? Points to make it less addictive. One day there'll be one of those things about 
like they've done with the cigarette companies. We're like, no, oh, mm-hmm. we knew what we were doing with nicotine. Sure. Like, there, they, you can see interviews with some of these code guys uh, from ten years ago, where they're explaining we're figuring out ways to keep kids coming back and and more connected. But again all the more reason to leave the phone at home and and hike down a trail everyone at the new world orders your sanity is going to is is going to be you're going to have to be the guardian of your own sanity because if if you want to just carry this phone around with you everywhere and check it every 10 seconds you, you, it is designed to to beak you up and spin you out you're going to have to just get control of that all right a very twilight zone uh a line from the movie, if you're not buying the product, you are the product. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. All right, let me hit uh, GovX, and we'll bring uh, Perez in. Military and, or first responder, perhaps you're one of those heroes. Visit GovX.com. Sign up for free instant access to tons of deals and a community that honors your service. Your job demands a lot. Deployments, long shifts, dangerous situations. GovX believes patriots deserve special recognitions. Deal on, uh, get deals, I should say, on the gear you need for uh, on and off duty life. Brands like Oakley, Yeti, Garmin, Danner, and more, all the big name brands on there. Every month, GovX supports nonprofits serving military, first responders, and law enforcement communities as well. Sign up, it's easy. It is fast, and it's totally free. Become a member today. Use the code ADAM for 15 bucks off your first order of 50 bucks or more. GovX.com is where you go. Savings for those who serve. All right, we'll take a a quick break. We'll talk to our old friend Perez Hilton right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. I'm addicted to T.J. Hooker now, you bastard. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Love Boat and T.J. Hooker, and if there's time, maybe whatever's coming on Netflix about social media. Perez Hilton has uh, joined us. He's got a new book called TMI, My Life in Scandal. It's available Coming out October 6th on Amazon, I would suggest pre-ordering it now. And, of course, the podcast, the Perez Hilton podcast with Chris Booker. Good to see you, Perez. You, too. And I am bringing you the heat, Adam. And by heat, I mean talking penis. Can we? Please. I don't have enough cock talk in my life. (laughs) Have you talked about Chris Evans yet today? Not yet. We spoke about it yesterday. Yes. (laughs) Okay. Well, good. I'm I'm very happy because I love that right now I get to talk to a lady as well because on my podcast, it's just me and my other dude co-host. I want to know what women think and if there is truth to this. So if you haven't heard, over the weekend, Chris Evans posted on Instagram story uh, a screen recording of his phone that accidentally revealed a Peen pick, right? Which the world took to believe is his. And as somebody who's seen a lot of that in my life, it's thick. It's it's lovely. He, he has one of the best I've ever seen. I must admit. But coming out in his defense was Chrissy Teigen, and she says that when she and her girlfriends chat on WhatsApp, it automatically saves their breast pics and things like that they send to each other on their camera roll. And I just find that weird. Like, why would you keep it on your camera? Well, I don't know. Um, what I do know is that he's not commented on this, Chris Evans, but his brother, who uh, is a gay guy that I know, uh, joked about it on Twitter. And it seems that everybody, um, everybody's all about it. <laughs> well, all right, let's figure this out. His is, it, what, I guess his brother's out, unless you just outed him. No, no, his brother's out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he, 
Now, would it be diabolical to just get a picture of a large, girthy penis and put it on your phone so that people assume that was your penis and then you don't confirm it or deny it so you don't lie about it and then everyone just thinks you have a giant hog and we talk about it on my podcast for 15 minutes with Perez Hilton? Genius. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's no longer associated with Disney and Marvel. He left the role of Captain America, so he doesn't have to keep up this image of being, you know, sexless or whatever. Um, I don't know. Do you have any dick pics on your phone, Adam? No, I've often said this about my dick. It's not really worthy of a picture. My, <laughs> And now I don't mean that in a super negative way, but some guys – uh, I've talked about it in my stand-up routine a little bit, but some guys have those super veiny dicks, like their dicks look like Wolverine's neck. My dick is not that way. My dick just kind of looks like uh, you know, a white long sleeve dress shirt. You know, it's just not a lot of definition. There's not a lot of vascularity. Lousy. Yeah, it's, you know, fair to midland size. You know, it's just uh, taking a picture of my dick would be like if there was a, 2006 Camry parked out front of this building that was beige with a cloth interior. And I was like, Dawson, get a picture of the Camry. And then Dawson would go, why? And then I'd go, that's exactly why I don't take a picture of my dick. That's what, that's what Siri says. Siri, get a picture of this. Why? Why? Right. Uh, Perez, you have any it, dick? It, Perez, I think, is frozen up, at least in the video department, but we can hear you okay. Are you? Uh, do you have any dick pics floating around? It did freeze. That's Oh, perfect timing to all <laughs> yeah. of a sudden not hear Perez. Oh, yeah. Uh, as soon as the dick pic mirror gets turned on you. <laughs> it's also uh, an, an, an age thing. I think there's a window for dick pics, and I was on, I'm, I'm outside of that dick pic safe harbor or something. It's a young I'm, man's game. Yeah, well, it's a young I, man's I don't game. Think I, I don't think I said this on the show yesterday. Maybe I didn't. If Perez can hear us, he can confirm. I, I told you the, the reviews were mixed. And by mixed, I mean men and women commenting on um, on the dick pic. And the hashtag thick daddy mm. was a reply. So, I mean, the man has nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah, I agree. Although I do think a dick is a lot like a cup. It's like a cupcake. There's the little mini cupcakes, and those are no good. There's right. the ones that are like four pounds, and you need a knife and a fork to eat. It's yeah, like it's too cakes. much cupcake. Yeah. And you go, well, what's bad about too much cupcake? It's like it's all over your face. You can't finish surprised. it. Now yeah. you got to, like, wrap it up, and you've eaten all the frosting off it. There's just a weird cake part at the bottom. I say a dick is like a good red velvet cupcake and that it's that nice kind of medium sweet spot size. I don't mm. I don't want to put dicks in your mouth, Gina. But, I mean words in your mouth, but am I right? The miniature cupcakes like unsatisfying. I don't know why I have to oh, eat nine of these. Unsatisfying. There's yeah. the novelty size ones that look good, but it's like really I gotta go out with a fork. Well, yeah, what do I what do I is this, do? What is, do I do this, with is this analogy about right with dicks? It is um you know, like those sprinkles cupcakes that are kind of heavy mm -hmm. and girthy the dot on the top, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, sprinkles. Um, yeah, it's a lot, and it it's not. Uh, it, it takes work. Mm. Um, I have a lot of experience with that. Mm. I, li I I so when I saw the the Chris Evans dick pic, I thought, oh, okay, yeah, that looks sort of familiar. A little smaller. I am. Um, um, cupcakes. You know what I like? I like when you're finished with the cupcake, but you rub some of the frosting on your chest. You know what I mean? Like so oh, good. Everybody does that. So yeah. good. Yeah. But that I mean, but yeah, that it's when when you want your name, your last name to be Widecock. I would be tread lightly with that mm. because it can be too wide. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean. Oh. I mean. Oh, no complaints. Yeah. I mean, lots of complaints. All right. So uh, Perez has fallen off. We'll see if he if he can uh, climb back on that horse. You know, I'll be curious because this is in. The, I have this for the news. Oh wait, yeah, my name was Cash Widecock, right? Cash White. I thought it was Chad. Yeah, no, it's Cash Widecock. Got it. Spread it around, by the way. Let, <laughs> let, uh, I'll, I'll be curious to see if he has any thoughts on the new Paris Hilton documentary on YouTube. I watched about half of it today. It just came out today. Yeah, are we? That. We're now at the point where we have to respect all these people for being incredible business people. Is that where we? Is that what it's come to? She it's has, come she to has nineteen product lines. 
it, it, it's it's now come to the point where we have to respect the Kardashians and Paris Hilton because it's like, well, look what a businesswoman she is and an entrepreneur she is. And she only uses the baby voice when uh, she needs to use the baby voice, right? There's a lot of that in the documentary because everyone just assumes she talks like this. And, hey, a lot of, like, vocal glottal, like, fry. And, mm-hmm. like, hey. and then you'll hear in the elevator with her sister, and she's like, where's my phone? <laughs> it's a very, very different voice. You just killed my boner, Gina. I had a, I had a <laughs> raging like boner. There. All the talk about cupcakes and frosting on the tits. I was going, man. And then yeah. you dropped yeah. that. Yeah, That's you, what she sounds like. Drop that exorcist voice in there. And just, it's just like somebody <laughs> well, hit, hit it with a fly swatter that they kept in the like freezer a, overnight. Electric fly swatter. Like Chris Farley and the Gaps guys, leave me alone. I'm starving. I'm starving. <laughs> like she's saying bye in the elevator to her crew. Like, bye, you guys. I'll see you after I get back from Korea and Geneva. Oh, my God. I forgot my dog. <laughs> it's very different. And you'll hear it a lot in the movie. Max Apata is reminding me that uh, Dancing with the Stars airs tonight as we uh, as we talk about this, and I got five large on Johnny Weir. Right. So, I understand why you wouldn't hedge your bet with uh, AJ McLean. Don't. Uh, well, yeah. first off, un- McLean, McLean. unclear. AJ is forty two. Johnny's thirty six. So he's got a little age advantage there. I don't think I wouldn't take AJ just because the odds makers have AJ. The odds makers go, he's a dancer. He's in a boy band. I would tend to take an NFL player over a boy band guy. I think there's probably a couple of guys that you're going to find and girls who may be, may, may, uh, may be a little more competitive than who they have. I think they reactively sort of go, well, that guy's in a boy band, so he knows how to dance. So they'll do it that way. The football players win that thing. Every other year, it seems like. Uh, also, but this there's... is a lock because you you remember from Christy Yamaguchi. Mm. This is a lock. But she does it on ice. <laughs> I also went and looked up Johnny Weir. You know, in his routines and stuff, he's doing triple axles and shit. I mean, he's he's no joke. He, he comes. He's a little bit of a you know he's flamboyant and everything, but he he does not kid around once that spotlight comes on and the music fires up. Uh, how many people are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's 18. And, uh, what is, what's Johnny? No, sorry, w- there, there's less than that. The, the last three are pros. I just, it just oh, kind of- oh, okay. There's, there's 15, I guess, or 14. Oh, 15. What did, uh, what's Johnny we're at now? Is he still four to one? Or is he uh, is he moving off that? Brian, this seems like the kind of action you'd want to get in on yeah, as well. I haven't checked the, all, all I'll, I'll take a look. We got Perez us. back, by the oh, way. Oh, Perez is back. Hey, Perez. Damn technology. <laughs> I know. That's all right. You moved out to your patio. The the thing I find interesting about Perez Hilton as I as I look at his bio, which I forgot about, his entire family fled Cuba from the Castro regime and was raised in Miami. I it wasn't so long ago. Can you tell us that story? Yeah. I was born in Miami. Both of my parents are Cuban and you know it's been in the news a lot lately because just yesterday Donald Trump was tweeting about accepting uh, a Bay of Pigs award, which doesn't exist. Uh, he just got an endorsement from some Bay of Pigs veterans. Um, I always felt out of place in Miami for many reasons because historically Miami Cubans, which run Miami are very conservative and closed minded people. And I was born a big gay. I knew I was gay when I was six years old and I got naked with the boy next door. And I knew that I had to leave. Uh, So I did. As soon as I turned 18, I went to NYU and I've never moved back, but I am very thankful because I don't think Perez Hilton as I exist today would be here if it weren't for my Cuban immigrant parents for the fact that, you know, since I could remember my parents who fled communism and started over in this country from nothing instilled in me this most incredible work ethic. They just programmed it in me that I had to work not just hard, but harder than everybody else. And I did. And I took that to heart. And also there's a big cultural difference In American culture, Anglo-America, the word gossip and to gossip 
is perceived as a negative thing most of the time. It has these connotations that are not good. But in Spanish, the, the translation is chisme, chismear, or ser un chismoso, chismosa. And it's actually viewed as a positive thing. Like you want to be chismosa. You want to know everything about everybody. And if it wasn't for that, I don't think I would have had the interest in talking about celebrities that I do and pursued it like I did. Well, you were certainly one of the first to the game. I mean, at least to put it up on the Internet. And it's crazy what all this stuff has turned into, what podcasting has turned into, what all these. I was listening. uh, I think Chris played a uh, we did a like Corolla classic that was like eight or ten years ago. Maybe we were talking about the. TV show Bosch with uh, Titus Welliver. And I jokingly said about eight years ago, I said, well, oh, now one. And then Apple's going to have a TV network or, you know, it's going to be running original material, you know, and it's like, oh, yes, they are. So is everybody. So is everything. Every everybody is creating content now. It was so narrow back in the day. It was like AM radio, FM radio you know, handful of channels and then HBO and Showtime. And it's now just everywhere. And how do you, do you look at being innovative? Do you try to think of like what's next? Like what, where, where are people going to be getting their information? How are they going to be consuming it? What are they going to be consuming? How much of your time do you sort of spend thinking about that? Absolutely. And I think it helps that I, I'm so nimble. I am a person so that I can adapt. I made a gamble on TikTok to the point where people were criticizing me for it because I joined TikTok well over a year ago. You know, in the summer of 2019, before it blew up and before the pandemic really helped it and everybody locked in their homes wanting that extra content, especially free content that they didn't have to pay for. Uh, Now, thankfully, I have more followers on TikTok than I do on Instagram and than I do on Twitter. And they recently launched this um, partnership called the TikTok Creator Fund, which is like being on YouTube and you can make money from your videos. So now I'm monetizing that and it's wonderful. And it's also helped me reach a younger audience that weren't even born, some of them, when I started in 2004. So I've only um, benefited from TikTok, and I'm obsessed with TikTok. I love it. Perez, I'm sorry our connection is still a little bit shaky. I can hear and understand everything you're saying, but it's still... uh, I can call you. Yeah, maybe we'll try. It's still a little choppy. Maybe we'll see if we can do... Yeah, I sent over a number. We'll see if we can do... We'll see if we can do a call. (laughs) It always clears up when we're talking about it. Okay, I'll call you then. What is your phone number? It's like, it's always perfect then. I've been dealing with this all day, so we'll try try and do an audio version of this. Um, Yeah, TikTok. It's so... See, here's my... We were talking about we we're talking about this before. Um, all roads lead to narcissism. So anything you do that lets people like I have an app where you film yourself shaking your ass for twenty seconds, and then we put it out to the universe. Everyone goes, "I'm in." Like that's why the ice bucket challenge works so well. It wasn't because it was for charity or ALS. No, people get to film themselves doing something silly. Right. All these things are about narcissism, engagement, and you. I mean, think about, here's something that's interesting. You know, uh, I we started off the show. I was talking about my dad. Today's his 89th birthday. You could find seven pictures of my dad before the age of 40, like literally seven. <laughs> There's like one where he's wearing a, you know, he's wearing a sailor's outfit when he's five on the roof of his place in South Philly when you'd go to the roof to take a picture. Like, go up to the roof. We're taking a picture. You know, there's there's five pictures of my dad before 40. And in total, there's probably 13 pictures of my dad. He's 89 years of age. My kids have been chronicled since the day they came out of the womb. Oh, oh sorry. Before that. Because yeah. we had the ultrasound of them before they were 
born. And then there's a sex video of me knocking up their mom. So it actually goes way, way back. Medium width dick, by the way. So I don't know what this is going to do to have this chronology, this, this capturing of every human that's been born now from the day go to to the to death. I know Perez, any thoughts? He's on line one. He's yeah. on line one. Oh, sorry. Hi, Perez. Sorry. I love it. You know, my dad passed away when I was 14. I wish that I had silly video of him or even more photos of him. Well, I have photos, actually, but I wish I had more video. You know, he died in 93. So, you know, we still had that big old huge clunky camcorder with the you actually put the VHS tape in it right and we just didn't take that many videos do um chris i i sent chris a video of a woman yelling at the cops if chris will find it but it's it's one of these things where i wanted to kind of do a segment on this show because some of it is great. Your dad's in great shape. Your mom's never looked better. They're wearing stylish clothes. They're on the dance floor. But there's also lots of videos out there now that people wish. with the cost. Yeah, or doing the full Karen mask argument in a Costco. You know, that, that stuff's going to live on the Internet forever as well. Here's one I gave to Chris. I was like, this woman's going to have grandchildren one day, and this is going to be on the Internet. Play the video. Sorry, uh Chris. But if you take that bad job, I'll fuck your dick. Take that bad job, put that job, I'll fuck the fuck out of your dick. You want to throw? I'll eat your fucking too, I don't need to do that. She's got a badge, and she's got a bullhorn, and she's yelling at the cops, take that badge off, I'll suck your dick. Oh. Take that badge off. Really? If, if, if you play it again, you can kind of you can kind of hear it. It's a little tough with the bullhorn. But if you take that badge off, I'll fuck your dick. Take that badge off, put that job, I'll fuck the fuck out of your dick. You want to throw? I'll eat your pussy too, lady. I don't think you're going to all right, I'll suck the fuck out of your dick. I'll eat your pussy too. And at some point, some <laughs> nine-year-old's going to be Nana. Nana said. That... <laughs> Also, be funny. It's a different time. None of the cops took her up on it, but I wonder if there wasn't a guy, like a protester, standing behind her, going, uh, "I got a badge. Uh, yeah. Is that uh, is that count? I'll take it off. You know, <laughs> sorry. I have three children, and I also have a plethora of cringy, super embarrassing video of myself out there. If you go on my TikTok, probably you would think maybe half or more of my videos are embarrassing. I do know that unless you're a total crap parent, your kids are still going to love you. They might be embarrassed by you, but they're not going to love you any less because you said something silly or did something stupid on a video. What matters ultimately is how you treat your children at home, I think. Is there this danger and maybe... Maybe you could say, well, we've evolved into this. But I was talking to uh, Dr. Drew earlier today, and we both realize as sort of old, white, straight guys, there's no real reverence from your kids. Like Dr. Drew's kids are always coaching him up and dressing him down, explaining to him how the world works and stuff like that. <laughs> My kids do the same to me. Like nobody listens to me. And I, and I realize when I was a kid, a dad was a dad and a grandpa was a grandpa and a coach or a teacher was like Mr. or Mrs. And there, we didn't we didn't even know our teacher's first names. I didn't know my friend's dads. God forbid I knew their first name. There wasn't all this crazy video of them acting like jackasses when they were 19, which now sort of makes you more and more human. And it it's sort of whatever that chasm was that we had when we thought about parents and cops and teachers it's kind of gone now i think i think everybody you know your your dad is kind of your friend now almost a contemporary not the relationship we all grew up with with our dads i'm guessing your cuban dad perez was probably old school maybe a little traditional i mean you did not yeah, have very. and god forbid his friends right did you go up to his friends and just call them by their first name and make jokes about them or tell pull my finger <laughs> like, would you do that with your dad's friends? No, but I, you know, I, I, um, I, I would get, in, I, I, I would get in trouble some for other things. Like, 
you know, I don't even know. Oh God, I'm so embarrassed now. Like the first and only story that popped into my mind was, I think my dad beat the crap out of me after I did this, but he had friends over and I just farted in front of everybody. <laughs> and then my dad just beat the crap out of me. Like, <laughs> how dare you do that? <laughs> like, uh, I was, I was like 12 or 13 or something. And, um, uh, yeah, I learned my lesson, though. <laughs> that did not happen again. <laughs> uh, it is funny that you got a fart story, but also that your dad's used, old school. I used to, you know, I used to be so fat when I was young, and I would eat all the time and eat unhealthily. So, you know, that happens a lot. How how did you lose all the weight, however much that was? How much weight have you lost? Well, I get, it, you know, I almost feel like Oprah in a sense that... I've yo-yoed a lot of my life, and I think a lot of people have. Uh, for the most part, I, I think I've been able to get that under control. But then, you know, last year happened, and it was really hard for my family. My mom had cancer, and my mom also had more health issues, and I started overeating and overspending, which is a major problem as well. Then I lost all the weight. And then I was back at my normal self. And then this year happened with the quarantine and I have three small children and I was losing my mind because they went from having school and structure to having one hour a day of Zoom and then nothing else. So I started to overeat and overeat and I even started to drink and I'm not even a drinker, but I went from drinking once every three months to drinking every day. So I get in three months, I gained 42 pounds. Wow. That took a lot of effort. <laughs> well, and then how do you so, how do you lose the weight? So finally, you know, when they opened the gyms up again, I said, "Thank God, I'm just going to go back to the gym even though I know I knew it was risky." And then they closed the gyms 2 weeks later. They were only open for 2 weeks. So then I had a decision to make. Am I going to keep going down the potentially, you know, deadly path that I was heading down or am I just going to stop? So I stopped and I found this, um, I actually found, I bet every person needs to find what works for them. Like, I know that if I'm going to, you know, try to look up YouTube videos of people working out, that won't work for me. Or if I'll do some on-demand thing, that won't work for me. I actually found a live fitness studio that does Zoom classes. And I started to do that, and they're expecting me, they watch me live, so they correct me. It's almost like being at the gym, and you don't have to have a, uh, any equipment. And, and it's like it saves me money and time, so I'm, I'm hooked. I've, I've gotten all my friends to join now. <laughs> and Great idea. Did oh. you, uh, your three kids, what is the relationship you're, you're living in now? Are you, you married, boyfriend, the three kids? No. How, how did that work out? I am very single but open to an amazing person, but... You know, as I talk about in the book, most gay men hate me, so I'm not expecting or, uh, anything to happen anytime soon. But um, I live here in the main house, and behind me is a little guest house where my mom is at, and she's a big help. And also, I have a nanny. You know, I'm, I, I need the help because my mom also is in poor health still, even though she's thankfully cancer-free now. Um, and... Um, you know, I think on some subconscious level, I wanted to have children on my own without a partner just because I'm a pragmatist. You know, I know that most relationships don't work out. And I always wanted to be a dad. And that's the most important thing in life to me. And I work so hard at it. I didn't want to have to worry about splitting custody or four days here, three days there. You know, these are my kids. If I'm lucky enough to meet an amazing guy and eventually get married, he's not going to adopt them. They're still going to be my kids, and I will be making the decisions that I think are best for them. And how did the kids work? Did you get an egg donor, your sperm? Yep. Like, how did it work? Yeah, I had an egg donor, a separate surrogate, and my sperm. So it's the same egg donor for all three children, three separate surrogates. And oh. um, it was really a funny story, too, because I went to this one, you know, surrogacy agency that everybody uses that are the power gays. <laughs> and mm -hmm. they have a VIP list of egg donors, which is all of these 
former beauty queens. Like, I, I, it doesn't say what their profession is, but I know, I'm like, that woman, there's a type. Like, you are a former beauty queen. You're a former beauty queen. And I ended up not choosing my egg donor from that list. I ended up choosing a normal girl from the normal list. And the reason I chose her is because, well, for two reasons. And you know me, Adam, I love to be honest. The first main reason, this woman that I chose looks like me. Mm. We could be related. I'm like, she could be my cousin. So I knew that if I had a child with her, my kids would look so much like me, and they do. And the second reason I chose her, in addition to her reminding me physically of myself, is that she seemed really nice, like I saw her videos. I did a secret Skype with her where I typed the questions and my sister asked her all the questions. Uh And like, it's like dating, right? Like as soon as I met her, like it was more than dating. I'm like, you're it. You are the one. Like I just, like all the answers were what I wanted to hear. And she seemed so nice. And in the future, when I explain it to my kids, why did you choose that woman? I'm like, oh, because she looked like me and because she seems really nice. And to me, that was important. My sister and my mom make fun of me. They're like, nice isn't genetic. And I, and, and I countered, well, how do you know? How do you know? Well, <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> let's, all, let's all form our questions because I feel like if I was meeting a potential egg donor – and I just I didn't care about, you know, I'm done looking at the height and the weight and the degrees or the deva- advanced degrees or I'm done checking their gums and their teeth. I'd ask questions like you're going out and you're going to have fish tacos. Do you get <laughs> the battered deep fried on the flour tortilla or do you get the from the grill on the corn tortilla? Yeah. And I would factor in that stuff very heavily. You have to ask the tough questions, Perez. Yeah. They can't all be a cakewalk. So it, how much does it cost? And is it oh, true? God. Is it, you know, they always say donate your eggs. No one's donating their eggs. They're selling their eggs, right? And if you want you know, Rhodes Scholar and over 5'11 and played a little semi-pro beach volleyball, you're going to have to pay for that egg, right? Well, not just the egg, the egg, the egg donor, the surrogacy agency, the fertility clinic, the lawyer that the surrogacy agency gets you because you need a lawyer because the laws are different in every state. There's some states in the United States where surrogacy is not allowed. Um, And even here in Los Angeles, the law keeps on evolving with my first child, even though he was biologically mine, my DNA, I still had to have an independent court appointed observer come and interview me and make a decision and tell the judge, oh, he's perfectly fit and you should give the child to that person, even though it's my child. That didn't happen for my daughters who were born after my son, uh, but it's also, yeah, uh, something that I don't regret whatsoever, even though it cost me between two hundred and twenty five and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per child. Yes. Per child. Per child. Yeah. Yes. Jesus Christ. I fucking argued with my dad about tough skins versus Levi's my entire <laughs> childhood. Like, dad, it's three dollars, but it's such a superior product. The Levi's oh, son. That's a lot of money for dungarees. Jesus Christ. So I would love, you know, I would love to have a fourth and final, but I I don't have FU money in the bank. You know, mm. I, I don't have unlimited resources because. So you, I, I have to support my three kids and my mom, and my sister works with me as well. So my sister's livelihood is tied to mine. I have all this pressure on my shoulders. <laughs> the, that's why I work. But that's why I work as hard as I do still. How much is the years later? How much is the average egg? And then what's more expensive, the egg or the surrogate who carries the egg for nine months? I think the egg, because shockingly, the surrogates don't get paid that much. The surrogates make, yeah, the surrogates make about $20,000. It's not that much. That's outrageous. And the eggs are more than 20. I mean, if you want to get the right egg. 
Yeah, the age I think of mine was about 24 to 26. I don't remember the exact age of hers. Oh, oh the age of... It's it's funny because I remember in college, flyers all over campus about egg donation because they're 18 to 22-year-old girls. It was papered all over campus to do this. It's a little weird Norwellian, but on the other hand, I'm glad it exists. Uh, but yeah. it's also kind of weird that you have to pay more for the taller, smarter ones with the nicer teeth than the, uh, I didn't even know. Is there sort of a bargain bin? Is there like, <laughs> everything must go. Well, they're picked over. Like I said, there's the, there's the VIP list, but there's also other things that you can do. One of which I purposefully didn't, you know, if you're a baller enough and if this matters to you, you can buy out the egg donor meaning you can pay her to not donate eggs to anybody else. I purposely didn't choose that because in the future, how I will, my kids already know their whole birth journey and how they came to be. You know, they know it as much as they can for their ages. But when I go into more detail as they're older, you know, if they ask any questions about a mother or siblings, you know, I will describe it as, they're people who share similar DNA. That doesn't mean she's your mother. That doesn't mean they're your siblings. Because this woman, for all I know, could have donated eggs and had, you know, donated eggs to 30 other couples. And there could be 30 children of hers. That doesn't mean that all of those people are my children's brother and sister. They just share DNA. It's interesting that there's the option to buy them out. <laughs> it's like optioning a yeah. book. Yeah, what's in it for you? What's in it for the person who buys them out? Yeah. Well, if you just, pre- just prevent the egg from getting to someone else. Yeah. Like to, to have a sort of out of spite. <laughs> no, no, it's it's I a no. Yeah. No, I think I think what do I know? But, you know, it's like you would then have half brothers and half sisters sort of biologically running around the planet that you would have no relationship with if that's the if you cared. Right. I mean, I, that's what people are saying. Right. I guess there's people who care about yeah. that. Yeah. They're like, I hear like, yeah, when, I don't uh, care. Like, well, I, you know, but I don't view those. But would people you as my children's right. potential but brother or sister? Could we agree on this? That if you bought an egg or you purchased an egg from somebody and you said and they said. You have a choice. Does this person harvest more eggs and have them fertilized or not, this this is the egg. This is their egg. This will be the only egg. There's no cost. There's no penalty. There's no anything. But you, there's just a wish. Would you prefer this or not prefer it? I think I would prefer this be the one egg. Do you guys feel that way? I literally have no thoughts on it. I, I, I could care less about 100 more eggs out there. I, I really couldn't care less. But you – so you, you just flip I, a I coin. I don't personally because – I wouldn't because then it almost makes it – to me, the wonderful egg donor is the wonderful egg donor. It's not their mother. She's just somebody that has similar DNA. That's why it's not important to me. But would I you, wouldn't care. I, I for wouldn't that look. I wouldn't sweat it, and I wouldn't pay for it. But if you gave me a magic wand, I'd have. I'd probably go. No, this will be the last egg because there. Then it would seem that there would be half biological, half siblings running around the the neighborhood or the planet. Which, you know what? If you look at it that another, way. Well, I, I, it's, a, it's an egg and a sperm, right? But another way to think of it is if I had the option, I would probably say go donate like this yeah. is your business. Because I wouldn't want her to think, well, that's my kid, too, and that's the one. You know, I'm kind of attached exactly. to this one now. Mm-hmm. I Just go do this with your life. It's not about me and my family that we're creating. What if they moved in upstairs to a small <laughs> unit, an apartment you lived in, and you started seeing these kids that had a strange uh, way of, of, of sort of, uh, they seem to be a little clingy to your knee when you were walking down to yeah. the washing machine. You just got to kick that, them away. That would complicate things. Yes. I don't there, know. There I had, are stories hmm. like that I've heard. Well, I wonder how many ballers buy into that. Like, I... I I will meet you halfway, Adam, and say that I, I'm imagining that 
I'm imagining that the majority of people who are in this market, right, to buy eggs uh, are in maybe like major metropolitan areas like L.A., New York, San Francisco, a limited number of cities. So it's not out of the question that there could be another child roaming around of their of that child's age. And God forbid they should meet and fall in love. And, got, you know, mm. that's a remote possibility. Have but some, it's not out of the question. Have some zombies. Well, also, yeah. another thing that's not out of the question is people – I think there was a Vince Vaughn movie with this as a theme yeah. about seven years ago where your kid could go, I want to meet the other people that bought this woman's egg because they are my half, whatever. I mean, it's not going to happen. It's just a Vince Vaughn movie. But uh, Delivery Man. Delivery Man, the great wow. Vince Vaughn. Hey, uh, Perez, I'm going to give you a plug and let you go before we go into news just because our technology is a little uh, screwed up there but we'll come into the studio when you're when you're feeling uh adventurous and uh we'll uh we'll do it in person the book is tmi my life and scandal it's available october 6 on amazon and uh you can pre-order it now podcast Perez hilton podcast with chris booker as well available wherever you get podcasts podcast one spotify and apple and all that as well and the youtube channel perez hilton Thanks, Perez. We'll uh, we'll do it. We'll do it you. longer and better next time. All right, let me hit right, uh, hit cooler shock here. Reusable premium. Uh, oh, let me put them on hold there. Yes, ice pack for your uh, cooler. It is fourteen degrees cooler than ice, if you could imagine, and it's cleaner, more sanitary. No bacteria laden water left behind. Nothing worse than when it all melts and then you got it all sloshing around in there and it's getting all furry because someone forgot about it. Made in the USA, average of four point seven stars on Amazon, over sixty eight hundred reviews, so you know it's good and people are talking about it. Ready in your freezer when you need it. Avoid the trip to the store during the quarantine. Uh, they've got a variety of soft and hard packs, even a 16-pound pack with a built-in thermometer. So it's good for fishing and camping and hunting and long road trips and even a farmer's market for the best price. And go to CoolerShock.com. Use the coupon code ADAM and get the 10% off. That's uh, CoolerShock.com. Get the free shipping and 10% off when you uh, use the coupon code ADAM. All right. So let's talk about a couple other little ditties and then we'll um, get into the news. Um, yeah, the whole uh, I did the in vitro thing, which is weird. Uh, Drew did the in vitro thing. He ended up with triplets. I ended up with twins. Oh, yeah, you we, did. We, we went through several rounds of it, ended up having tested naturally, but we were very familiar with the whole whole process. Yeah. Adam, but, why did you do that? Why uh, did you do that? We, couldn't, we couldn't get pregnant, and uh, we did the shots and, and all that stuff, and just nothing, nothing was nothing uh, working. And um, eventually just this – I guess I was probably talking to Drew – out of the in vitro thing, it kind of feels like the fat guy who finally loses weight after all those years and you know he got the bariatric thing. Like, it's like, it's just it, when nothing else is working, this thing, this does work. Uh, of course, we ended up with triplets originally. And then Natalia successfully killed one. That's right. <laughs> she's working on the other. We did the, uh, then there's that weird thing where they go, Would you like to reduce? And you're like, reduce. Oh, and then, uh, God, I don't I don't think two days went by and the third just kind of sloughed off or something like it was. It didn't have to make that decision. Not not even sure what the decision. You know, we didn't even really talk about it. It just sort of happened that way. And uh, And yeah. Well, I'm just curious. So that makes sense. And then, Brian, you did it, and then it didn't work, and then you just had Tessa? Oh, man, it's a long story. I'll try and be as brief as possible. Because I was on a Vastin for so long, uh, a lot of doctors, like, warned us, like, um, oh, we don't know what the long-term effects are. Uh, you know, this is a new drug. It hasn't been studied in fertility and stuff, so you're really taking a risk. So, of course, we decided to uh, – go the, the, uh, the IVF route, which is a lot more, you know, safer, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then after unsuccessful, a few unsuccessful rounds of that, which is expensive, Adam, as you know, um, we actually found a doctor in, uh, in, 
I sent my fucking sperm away to Minnesota in like a freeze dried thing to have it tested. I found some doctor in like Oregon who had written an article on it, basically saying, "Yeah, I'll buy all indication, should be okay." And our doctor, kind of Doctor Rudnick, gave us the blessing to try natural. He's like, yeah, "Just see what happens," and uh, boom, pregnant. Wow. Yeah, my only memory was that stupid part where the sperm they needed the sample and it's like if you live more than 20 minutes away from the clinic you have to produce the sample at the clinic now this is one of those things that i happen to know see my thing in life is if you go to home depot and you buy an a-frame ladder and the ladder says it's rated up to 300 pounds, that means a 900-pound person could successfully use the ladder. Because if it says 300 pounds, you can go at least 300. You could double it. it it's not going to break the ladder. And when they tell you 20 minutes, if you're further than 20 minutes, you have to rub out the sample at the office. And I'm like, you can hear the ladies talking in the waiting room, you know. And I was like... We're like 25 minutes away from uh, the place. There's, why can't I just do it in the comfort and safety of, of my I own? It's like, mind like South Dakota. Or I, I know. Like I know. Tank. This is the rules. They just go, no, here's what's happening. Here's the rules. And I was like, we're 25 minutes away. They'll go in and do it. Do it there. And uh, that's that's the part that I remember the most, the, uh, the basket of porn. All I right. can't imagine that that's part of, of a scientific... <laughs> Exercise to have baby. I mean, if somebody said that to a woman, <laughs> I just go oh my god, faster, Yeah, would you like to bring your own candle in? That was the that was the best part by far. <laughs> That's the, insane. The um, sounds so crazy. Well, first, for for once, my my public masturbation is legally sanctioned. You know what right. I mean? Like for once, right? To <laughs> take the magic out of it. <laughs> they were allowed. They encouraged by a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, I yeah, and I I take that back because isn't that how they used to perform exorcisms on women? Oh, really? Oh, really? I think that's the story. That's with the a, lore. With a candle, or we're may, or making them have a, with a device. A device. Yeah. Oh. I think everything that guys think of eventually goes down that that direction. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when you ever, whenever I think about religions, you know, like how does religion work? Like when you look at like the Rastafarian religion, it's like well. Uh, women work and uh, men hang out and smoke weed and then uh, uh, they have to have sex with us when we want. But then we're allowed to have sex with anybody all the time. Well, the women are unclean, though. You can't have sex with the men. Yeah. No, and then right. they have to serve us. Does that seem about right, fellas? Yeah. yeah okay. Decided. All right. It's good. <laughs> yeah. This basically it's how it's the same way department stores lay down the rules for their gift cards, right? Like, okay, <laughs> let's see. Everyone gives us all the money up front, uh, right? I like where your head's yeah. at, Bob. All right. Uh, it'll expire in uh, calendar year, and then we'll keep that money if they don't come in, right? And for every Good. month they don't use it, we'll take a little off. Yeah, the, uh, a processing fee for every yeah. time they don't use it. Ooh, uh, question. Uh, let's say it's $200 on the gift certificate, and the guy buys $186 worth of merchandise. Do we give him change? No, why would we? Well, in the form of money he must then spend at yeah. uh, said store. So he's yeah. got to find like a belt that costs fourteen dollars, right? And so we'll I, give him. Oh yeah, two. but don't give him the money back, right? No, no ideally, no, a pair no, no, of no, shoes no. that cost eighty dollars. Oh yeah, yeah, and then he just reach into his yeah, wallet yeah. and go, "Okay, gotcha." Sorry, dumb question. Right? Hey, yeah, there's no dumb question except for that one, but we'll forget about it. Yeah, most the uh, most most of the religions, when you really break them down, you realize it was a bunch of dudes who came up with this because <laughs> they're very convenient on what the. I like the ones where like we don't have to shave our beards, we can't work during the day, like we gotta chillax. <laughs> Women are be working. I mean, dude, the Muslim religions. That's definitely a bunch of dudes came up with that one. Yeah, for sure. And the Orthodox Jews, we we sit around and read from the Talmud all day. You guys get to cooking. Oh, my God. If you've ever I did a man show bit where I hung with those guys all day who wear the <laughs> little boxes on their heads. Uh, this mm -hmm. this thing was built around dudes not working during the during the weekdays. Yeah. All right. Let me hit uh, bet online. Not taking action on Johnny Weir anymore. So says uh, Max Zapata. Yeah. Bet online. That's locked. They're locked in. All right. Well, you can uh, get it. Get in on some of the football games. A lot of good stuff. Now. Week one's over, so you got to see how some of these teams look. 
like Falcons, Cowboys, eh, Cowboys, bad call, got them out of the game there. Maybe, maybe they're looking to come back against the Falcons. I think they will. Uh, Bills, Dolphins, Rams, Eagles. Whoa, Eagles look looked rough last weekend. Sorry, uh, Eagles fans. Uh, more uh, options to wager than any other place online. Um, from spreads and totals to uh, props, you get get in on season opening bonuses and wager on uh, wins and division championships and futures as well. Head to Bet Online today. Take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Visit betonline.ag, our exclusive partner, Podcast One. Don't forget promo code Podcast One for your sign up bonus today. It's Bet Online, your online sports book experts. All right, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and do the news with Gina Grad right after this. 